Welcome back. So this is pharmacology, and today we're going to talk about diuretics. I'm going to try things a little differently this time. I'm using a different program, and I'm going to share my screen so we can look at the PowerPoint while I talk to you. See how that works out, okay? So diuretics. What is a diuretic? Well, a diuretic is a pill or an IV, it's medication that helps the kidneys kind of go into overdrive to reduce edema. And edema is an accumulation of excess fluid in the body. Um, edema in the body is typically associated with right-sided heart failure. And pulmonary edema, fluid in the lungs, is typically associated with left-sided heart failure. But people can retain fluid for other reasons. There's lymphedema, there's liver cirrhosis, which can cause abdominal ascites. That's fluid retention too. Corticosteroids, estrogen, lots of different medications can actually cause edema. And so diuretics can help to get rid of edema. What meds do you have to know? I'm gonna break this down, make it as easy as possible. Classifications, diuretics, and then you've got three subclassifications. First one is your loop diuretics. Your loop diuretics are furosemide, also known as Lasix, and bumetanide, also known as Bumex. What do you need to know about these? They are potassium depleting, so the patient is at risk for hypokalemia. And with Lasix and bumetanide as well, ototoxicity is a side effect, adverse effect. In other words, it can be toxic to your hearing. And if the patient has tinnitus, which is ringing or buzzing in the ears, that is a sign of ototoxicity. They need to stop the drug, call the doctor. Nephrotoxicity is another uh, adverse effect. That means toxic to the kidneys. So if the patient starts having increased urine output or their urine starts to look really concentrated like a brown color, you know, they need to call the doctor, stop the medication. And if you have an allergy to sulfa, sulfonamides, you can't have furosemide, okay? So those are your loop diuretics, those two, furosemide, bumetanide. They sound alike, don't they? Next is potassium sparing diuretics, and there's one med, spironolactone. So because it's potassium sparing, it's gonna make your body hold on to potassium, a big worry, hyperkalemia, right? And remember, potassium, queen mother. If it's high, if it's low, your patient can go into a severe dysrhythmia because when you think potassium, you think muscle. So hypo or hyperkalemia, either way, they're in trouble. Get them on an EKG, call the doctor, okay? And then the third subclassification are your thiazides, thiazide diuretics. The two that you need to know, hydrochlorothiazide and chlorthalidone. Those are potassium depleting. So again, hypokalemia is a potential adverse effect, okay? So we use these diuretics to treat edema that's associated with heart failure. Hypertension, when people are initially diagnosed with hypertension, we've tried lifestyle modifications like diet and exercise, and that doesn't work. Usually the first line of treatment to treat hypertension is a low dose thiazide diuretic like hydrochlorothiazide. We can also use their diuretics to treat renal disease, cerebral edema, that's edema in the brain, glaucoma, which is basically increased intraocular pressure due to excess fluid, and short-term management of abdominal ascites. If the patient has you know, liver cirrhosis, they can have that. What are the interactions you need to think about? Well, with those potassium depleting diuretics, the loops and the thiazides, remember, Digoxin's the queen mother of cardiac meds. And the number one risk factor for digoxin toxicity is hypokalemia. So if your patient is on DIG and they're also on a loop or thiazide diuretic, you are gonna be super careful to watch their serum DIG level, make sure they don't become hypokalemic or DIG toxic. If they're on anticoagulants, they have an increased risk of bleeding. Lithium, increased risk of toxicity with lithium too. Because when you think lithium, you think salt. 
And diuretics not only deplete potassium, but they'll deplete sodium as well. And hyponatremia is a risk factor for lithium toxicity. So, and just know that phenytoin, which is an anticonvulsant, and NSAIDs and salicylates, so aspirin, ibuprofen, meloxicam, celecoxib, um, naproxen, if they're on a loop diuretic or thiazide diuretic along with any of those meds, the diuretic is going to have a decreased level of effectiveness, okay? Um, if they're on spironolactone, which is the only potassium sparing diuretic, and they're on an ACE inhibitor, one of the prills, or an ARB, one of the sartans, or an aldosterone antagonist or a potassium supplement, well, you're worried about hyperkalemia. This is so easy. Diuretics, the loops and the thiazides cause hypokalemia. Spironolactone causes hyperkalemia. And that's what you need to know, okay? Whenever you're giving diuretics, you wanna make sure that you're assessing vital signs, of course but daily weights. If we're concerned about fluid retention, edema, I and O is not the way to tell if somebody's retaining fluid. Daily weights, same time, same scale, same location, after they, get, after they wake up, after they pee, before they eat, every day on that scale, because if they gain two to three pounds in a day or three to five pounds over the course of a week, that's not because they ate too much, that's fluid. Okay, you should always be looking at the serum potassium, serum sodium, and of course, renal function, the BUN and creatinine. And I put the lab values right there for you. You're welcome. Okay, and ongoing assessment, I can't say this enough. The right way to determine a patient's fluid retention is daily weights, daily weights, daily weights. You got some nursing diagnoses thrown in there. Um, you want to make sure that when the patient's receiving these medications, they're getting weighed every day. You're assessing their blood pressure, their pulse, their respiratory rate. If they have peripheral edema, guess what? Elevate the extremities. Let gravity help you out. That can help decrease some of that edema, right? Monitor their blood pressure. Always check their serum potassium levels. And if the patient is at home and they're taking diuretics, never, never, never do they take diuretics later than about one in the afternoon. Why you ask? Good question. Because even if the dose is BID twice a day, they should take it first thing in the morning, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, and then again at lunchtime. If they're home and they take it later in the day and they lay down and go to sleep, they're going to have to wake up to pee. And it's going to be an urgency because these diuretics, when you got to go, you got to go. And then there's an increased risk for them to fall because they're scrambling to get up to go to the bathroom. So remember, diuretics, when they're being used at home, you instruct your patient. If it's a twice a day regimen, you take it in the morning and you take it at lunchtime. You don't take it 12 hours apart, like you normally would instruct somebody, you know, like 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. Nope, in the morning and at lunchtime, the end, so that they're not waking up all night to go urinate and they're gonna fall, okay? And really, when it comes to the diuretics, I mean, we talked about the important things, just no. Loops and thiazides, hypokalemia. Spironolactone, hyperkalemia. If the patient is taking spironolactone, remember, salt substitutes, except for things like Mrs. Dash, which is an herbal. Salt substitutes, Morton makes a salt substitute. They have to read labels because most salt substitutes are potassium and they don't need any additional potassium if they're on spironolactone, right? So just make sure that, you know, patient understands that. And that's the end of this story. I told you this was going to be a short one. Diuretics, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Until next time, peace. And I will see you guys with the next uh, PowerPoint and video, which will be endocrine. All right. Have a good night. Bye.